Well, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tony Monaco, president of Tufts University. It's my pleasure to host the 2021 Tufts Presidential Symposium on Community Partnerships in conjunction with Tisch College of Civic Life and the Office of Government and Community Relations. Thank you for joining us today. You represent community leaders and partners, elected officials, Tufts faculty, staff, students, and alumni. I want to extend a warm welcome to our guest speakers, the Honorable Mara Healy, Attorney General of Massachusetts, and Ben Heyer, CEO of the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center. Ella Batel Asafa, a Tufts junior and Tisch scholar who is from the city of Boston, welcome. This is one of my favorite events of the year and I wish we could be together in person, even on a snowy spring day. By bringing together key stakeholders, the symposium helps advance one of the university's strategic goals, civic engagement, and one of my own personal priorities as president, to leverage the university's resources to support local communities. Each year, the theme reflects one aspect of our shared work. Last year, we focused on Tisch College's 20 years of student engagement in local communities. Today, we will center racial justice during the pandemic and beyond. COVID-19 exposed deep racial disparities in virtually every sector. It is our responsibility to learn, challenge ourselves, and develop ways to address social injustice together. Thank you for taking the time to engage with us today. Through community engagement, we learn from each other, we break down barriers, we build diverse and strong networks, and we're able to collaborate to address some of the complex issues facing society. The COVID-19 pandemic hit right after our last symposium and society shut down. As we gather today, I want to take a moment to reflect on our collaborations that have allowed us to navigate our way through these unprecedented times. The university partnered with elected officials healthcare institutions, and community partners to leverage our resources to support the challenges facing our host communities. Government and community relations managed an emergency grants program for local nonprofit organizations and gave out 30 grants. We also opened our residence halls for essential workers and recovering COVID positive patients. Our dining facilities to store food for food and rescue operations and we offered pool testing in the Medford and Somerville public schools. I am very proud of the strength of our relationships, which allowed us to quickly pivot and support each other when the pandemic hit. Tisch College created a fund for students to support pandemic relief efforts. This fund supported 78 student-led projects with $146,000 in funding since June. Now, before I pass the program over to Alan, I would like to thank and acknowledge a few key individuals. First, Shirley Mark, Director of Community Partnerships at Tisch College. Shirley is one of the primary organizers of this event every year, and I know many of you work with her. Rocco DeRico, Director of Community Relations and his team. And Mary Jaca, our Senior Vice President for University Relations. And now I'd like to introduce Alan Solomon, who will speak next. As Dean of the Tisch College, Alan has been an integral member of the senior leadership at Tufts. He has been a member of the Jumbo family since he was an undergraduate, and he has held many roles at the university, including as an active alumnus, trustee, and founding chair of Tisch College before returning to serve as its Dean. Alan is retiring this summer, and we are very grateful for his extraordinary leadership and service to the university. Thank you, and I will now think, hand things over to Alan. Well, uh, thank you, Tony, for that warm welcome, but also for those very kind words. Uh, it has been a pleasure for me these last seven and a half years uh, to work with you and, and my colleagues here at Tufts. And thank you also, as you do every year, uh, for hosting the Presidential Symposium 
on community partnerships. The fact that this is a presidential symposium speaks to the importance that Tufts University places on collaborating with its partners in our shared communities. We wish we were hosting all of you on the Tufts campus, and we hope that that is possible again soon, but it's still a privilege to gather together, even if it is virtual. I don't have to tell you that this has been a difficult and sometimes tragic year for so many in our shared communities. Let me express my deepest appreciation to many of our partners who during the pandemic are not only supporting the most vulnerable in their own communities, but who also continue to host, supervise, and mentor tough students, both last summer and during this academic year. We are proud that our students contribute to your work, but we know it takes extra time and effort to help students achieve their impact. On behalf of the university, thank you for making this a priority during such challenging times. We are truly grateful. Before I introduce today's speakers, Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healy, Tufts student Ella Patel Asafa, and the CEO of the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center, Ben Hires, I'd like to acknowledge some of the people who contributed to this morning's symposium. Many thanks to Shirley Mark, my colleague and Tisch College's Director of Community Partnerships for organizing this morning's event and for working with many of you year round. And to the Community Partnerships Committee, which is comprised of Tisch College board members and representatives of community partner organizations. Thanks also to the rest of the Tisch College team who contributed important, in important ways to this morning's symposium. Elizabeth Soong, Sarah Allred, Brianda Hernandez, and graduate student Victor Leos. Finally, from all of us, thanks to everyone who is serving as a facilitator or note taker in the breakout sessions. Following the keynote presentations, there will be 18 breakout discussions led by community leaders, faculty, staff, and students. The takeaways from these discussions, including your input and your insights, will inform our planning for future collaboration. As many of you know, for each year's symposium, we select a theme to guide our conversations, to strengthen our partnerships, and to help address pressing needs in our communities. This year's theme is centering racial justice during the pandemic and beyond. It is both timely and necessary. The COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare racial disparities that many here have spent their lives trying to address. These disparities are not new. They represent injustice and inequality that communities of color have experienced since Africans were first brought to this continent as slaves. The problems we face are profound, longstanding, and intractable. But by listening to each other, sharing ideas, and forging partnerships, we can strengthen our commitment to changing things for the better. To kick off our conversations, we will hear from three exemplary leaders who will share their perspectives and insights on the theme of today's symposium. And let us begin with the Honorable Maura Healy. Maura Healy is serving her second term as Massachusetts Attorney General, continuing a career devoted to fighting for justice and equal rights and wearing the mantle of the people's lawyer. A graduate of Harvard College, Maura spent two years abroad as a starting point guard on a professional basketball team in Europe, after which she attended Northeastern University School of Law. Her distinguished career of public service in the Commonwealth began as a special assistant district attorney for Middlesex County. In 2007, she joined the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office as Chief of the Civil Rights Division and later served as Chief of the Public Protection and Business and Labor Bureaus. During this time, she was lead counsel in the country's first successful challenge to the Defense of Marriage Act. Since her election as Attorney General in 2014, 
Moore has focused on confronting the devastating effects of the opioid epidemic, reducing gun violence, enforcing civil rights, protecting consumers, and addressing the climate crisis. She has also been a champion of improved access to healthcare and reproductive freedom. Last fall, her office released a report entitled Building Toward Racial Justice and Equity in Health, A Call to Action. This report mapped out a plan for addressing health equity during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. There is no better public voice to help us think about where we are and where we need to go than our Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Maura Healy. Maura, thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to your remarks. Good morning, Alan. It's great to be with you. It's great to, I'm amazed looking out my window at the fact that snow <laughs> is falling. Um, but, but so it is. Um, and I just want to thank you for the invitation to spend some time with you all this morning. Um, Alan, you're a, a dear friend and have been such a tremendous, tremendous leader in the work that you've been doing. I want to thank you. I want to thank President Monaco. Um, shout out to my friend, Mary Jekka, uh, who, uh, who we work with from time to time. And of course, to, to Shirley and the entire Tisch College team for helping uh, convene this event. I have always been so grateful for everything that Tufts does. My dad uh, was a Tufts grad, uh, studied engineering back in the 60s, and I had the good fortune of actually bringing a young person um, to campus last fall and, excuse me, last spring to tour. Um, I did my own COVID tour <clears throat> because things were, were closed down, and I was delighted to hear she got in and will be attending, and no, no finer institution. And I say that because I think Tufts has always had this ability to convene a diverse group uh, on campus and outside of campus, bringing to campus community and university stakeholders to learn from one another, to share best practices, and to forge new partnerships. And I really appreciate in particular uh, this time spent in recent years, the great work done through Tisch College to encourage civic engagement in our democracy. I'm also proud that our Fair Labor Division in my office uh, takes on Tisch Fellows each year, and it's been a really rewarding experience, I think, for everyone. So uh, it is our young people now who I look to, it is our young people who give me hope for the future, and I'm delighted to, to be here this morning. You know, to begin, Alan, I think that it, it's very hard to begin this, this discussion without recognizing what a difficult week especially, it's been for Black Americans on top of an already exhausting and heartbreaking year. You think about the traumatizing effects of the Derek Chauvin trial. You think about the killing of, of Dante Wright, the pepper spraying of Army Lieutenant Karen Nazario. And even in our own neighborhood, a grandmother in Dorchester shot on her own front porch during a beautiful spring day. I was speaking with a friend of mine who is, is a, an activist um, and has been out there and I've walked alongside her in many of the protests. I talked to her yesterday to just check in and she just said to me, we're so tired. We're so, so tired. We were having a conversation about what might happen in the outcome of the Chauvin trial and you know, it just <clears throat> struck me. I, I heard in her voice, as I've heard in the voices of others, um, how real the pain is, how constant the grieving has been. And it's why we need to do everything we can right now in seizing this moment and this opportunity to address racial injustice, racial disparities. I also am mindful of what's happened in our Asian American Pacific Islander community. A year ago, there were only 100 hate crimes reported. Hate crimes are vastly underreported in this country to begin with, but 100 reported last year against the AAPI community. 4,000 this year alone. It's real, you've seen it. Um, and, it's, and it's just emblematic of, of what it is we are confronting and reckoning with in our country. 
I've talked a lot about the pandemic and, you know, the pandemic has been uh, horrific in so many, so many ways. One thing <clears throat> I think it has done is really lay bare the deep systemic inequities, disparities that have existed through time well before this pandemic. And in fact, not only it has, has it laid those disparities bare, it's exacerbated those disparities. So I'm personally one for engaging in uh, real deep solutions to these problems. I think continuing to nibble around the edges isn't going to do it. And that's why the issue of racial justice and equality is, is top priority in my office, is truly centered in all the work we do across the divisions. And I'm delighted it's the topic of today's symposium. It should be the focus, in my view, of all of our work going forward. When I think about what it takes to <clears throat> center racial equity, I'll tell you what it's meant from the lens of, of, of our office. And I'll say a couple of things. Number one, this is really hard work. I think to fight for, achieve, work to address racial equity, racial disparities, understand it requires significant, persistent intentionality and in work. It's not easy. That's the first thing. And so I, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that. And, um, and then secondly, realize that disparities cross the realm of everything we see and do and encounter in our lives. And so that's the approach that we've taken. To start with, I think, what's been on top of mind on, on, for most people lately, and certainly in the news, vaccines. Now, during the pandemic, we've seen again and again that the health risks and the financial risks of, of COVID are not evenly distributed. Over the last year, of course, black and brown residents in our state and across this country have been much more likely to be infected, to be hospitalized, to die from the virus than white residents, uh, losing their lives to COVID at much, much higher rates. And the fact is that even though some communities of color have suffered an outsized burden from the virus, these same communities still lag far behind white residents in some of our vaccination rates, particularly among the Latinx community. And so we need to continue to be very intentional about vaccination distribution. Um, and I wanna applaud those members of our healthcare community, um, the hospitals, uh, the community health centers, other nonprofits who have been working so hard to do so much, in particular, to focus on the need for community-based care uh, to make sure that we are addressing issues of uh, vaccine equity. I've been recently visiting a number of these community-based sites. I happened to be out in North Adams yesterday. I was in Quincy the other day. You know, and again, when I talk about intentionality down in Quincy, I was struck by the number of uh, volunteers and providers who spoke multiple languages, materials available and languages accessible um, to the public and having individuals who were literally able to reach out and make telephone calls to members of the community in a language accessible to them to book appointments and get them in for shots. And this is not easy work, I can see, but it's the kind of intentionality and effort that we need to bring to this work. You know, I think um, it's also laid bare the existing healthcare disparities in illness and disease that have existed for a long, long time. As you know, residents of color face higher rates of heart failure, stroke hospitalization, diabetes-related death. Uh, black women die in childbirth at twice the rate of white women, and the infant mortality rate for black newborns is twice that of white newborns. And so, you know, I think that COVID-19 has just been a somber reminder frankly, an acknowledgement maybe for some for the first time uh, that we have failed to serve some of our most vulnerable residents. So yes, last fall, my team, uh, understanding that you know it's our job to apply a, a racial equity lens to the work that we do, decided to not publish a traditional report that we do on, on cost trends in healthcare, but instead to publish a report with actual recommendations on how we can translate our state's commitment to health equity into action. And these are some of the areas that we identified that we can actually take action on to address disparities in healthcare. 
improving how we collect and report patient demographics, especially around race and ethnicity. I think data is so key to identifying disparities and equitably distributing healthcare resources, tracking progress and the like. Uh, second, we have to acknowledge that affordable health care is an equity priority, and we have to consider new ways to ensure that cost doesn't prevent people from seeking care or filling needed prescriptions. Also, we need to make sure that the clinical health care tools work, starting with telehealth. I think that a lot of people benefited from telehealth throughout this pandemic, and that's a good thing. We also need to make sure that telehealth doesn't perpetuate or worsen disparities so we have to address things like the digital divide and build digital health literacy, ensure that patients have options to access care online or by phone in a way that works for them. And we need to make sure that our healthcare workforce represents the diversity of the patients it serves. You know, this lack of representation actually hurts the quality of care. And so I think what we need to do is make sure that we are expanding affordable and inclusive educational opportunities um, and also implementing the anti-racist uh, training, the cultural humility training uh, in medical education, in licensure, in certification. Um, I think that's incredibly important. And finally, when it comes to healthcare, we need to recognize that clinical care accounts for only a modest part of the health outcome of any one individual. And this gets to the social determinants of healthcare, communities, social, economic, and environmental uh, conditions. You know, they play such a large role. And so let's target uh, funding that addresses some of the root causes of health inequity and use the institutions uh, in coming together to use uh, resources to support this mission. So that's some of my thoughts on, on healthcare and how we as an office have tried to to center racial disparity in, in the healthcare space. And again, I wanna give great credit to our wonderful healthcare institutions in this state. I know they're paying hard attention to this. And I think that that is going to um, be incredibly important and powerful. Next week is Earth Day. And I'm gonna find myself, I think, out in Springfield, Massachusetts. I'm always happy to go to Springfield. Um, people kid me, of course, it's, it's home to the uh, National Basketball Hall of Fame, but that's not why I like to go to Springfield. I like to go to Springfield to check in and, and see folks. And next week I'm going because on this Earth Day, I want to recognize and lift up the fact that Springfield is the asthma capital of the United States. Yes, I said that right. <clears throat> Springfield is the asthma capital of the United States and a community that suffers from serious environmental injustice issues, but we're working on fixing that. My team published a report last spring where we took data, again, this is our environmental protection team, but they're, they're trying to focus racial equity and, uh, on all the work that's done. And you know, they had the idea of reaching out to local boards of health, actually through police chiefs, if you can believe it, figuring out where, pe where there were calls to, to homes for, for COVID, uh, whether they were for deaths or infection, mapping that data, and we worked with, with a school of public health at BU on this, mapping that data to, to racial uh, demographics in, in zip codes. And of course, uh, then we, we overlay that with uh, quality of, of air and air pollution rates. And wouldn't you know, of course, that communities that are disproportionately poor, communities of color, um, have worse rates of health pollution and suffer disproportionate rates of infection during COVID. And so I'm trying to, as a, and my, the team has lift up this issue. We recently uh, were able to purchase a number of, of air readers that we're gonna install throughout the city that will give real time a dashboard of air quality rates in the city. And that's gonna be important as we look to drive and, and target resources to address those issues um, while we continue to fight pollution and polluters in those, um, in those areas. Um, it, just an example of, of the way that I think we can call attention you know, to these issues, but environmental injustice is um, getting much more attention and, and it's so imperative uh, to the health and well-being of communities of color and certainly um, communities generally. Um, finally, I wanna talk a little bit about how we've tried to center the work, uh, recognizing some of the, the disproportionate economic impacts of, of COVID. 
And I believe that as we move forward, we can rebuild and, and protect our workforce too. This past year, we've had to entirely rethink how government provides essential public safety and healthcare and education and other court services. And I think we've done a lot um, that we can to support or try to the extraordinary working people who've kept our state and our economy going, our essential workers. Uh, of course, we understand nurses, first responders, doctors, but this crisis has shown that they are also our grocery store employees, our custodians, our delivery and rideshare drivers, warehouse workers, and so many more. They've all put their health on the line to get us through this crisis. And so making sure uh, that these workers have access to livable wages and benefits during this crisis and that their health and safety is protected was a top priority for my team. And many, of course, um, uh, of these workers uh, disproportionately are people of color. Um, so here's what we did. We mobilized to create an infrastructure immediately in the office. We set up a health and safety task force that was there to respond to complaints or conditions, uh, conditions, complaints about conditions to make sure that people had the PPE or other things that they needed. We worked to forge connections. You talk about partnerships, so important that we partner with our local boards of health um, or with the state agency, the Department of Labor Standards to, to try to make sure that people were getting guidance about best practices for, for PPE, social distancing, uh, the application of paid sick leave, and the like. And, you know, for me right now, one of the things we're working on is trying to figure out this gig economy and how this is going to work uh, for people going forward, because, you know, we want to make sure that people are, are protected and not exploited. And this is an area uh, disproportionately where there are a number of uh, disproportionate rates of people of color serving in the in the gig economy. Um, and so these are just some of the things that we're, we're working on. Um, I would say that for me, you know, one of the keys to partnerships is, is, is having a partner uh, before. Um, you can't develop partnerships as well in the moment of, of crisis. It, it's, it's far better to have spent the time and done the groundwork to forge these partnerships so that when crisis happens, you're ready and there. And that's what I think we should all be investing in. I know when I started as attorney general, I set up a council on race and equity. I set up a council uh, on new Americans I set up a council on disability. And the reason for this is that I wanted to make sure that my team and I were meeting every month with stakeholders from around the state to talk through these issues. So that when we learned that uh, so many were afraid to come forward, either to you know, visit uh, or uh, apply for uh, assistance, whether it was SNAP benefits or WIC for fear that that information was going to be turned over to the feds and maybe ICE was going to come after them. We wanted to get guidance out uh, to through our, our community stakeholders and, and people in the grassroots that people should not be afraid to come forward and seek that assistance. You can't do that. You can't dial it up in the moment. You have to have those, those relationships established right away. Um, same thing, you know, as we navigate what's happening around uh, things like vaccine ID, you know, getting word out through our immigrant stakeholder groups that no, you don't need to provide a vaccine, an, an ID in order to get a vaccine. Um, making sure that people understand through their own trusted community leaders um, that this government is there to protect them. Because a challenge I think <clears throat> is there is a lot of mistrust, distrust of government. But that's why I think partnership is so important because you have the validation from those with whom you, you seek to serve as you look to deliver service. Um, and, and finally, I think that in this moment, um, as, we, as we move into next week, um, I expect there will be a verdict next week in the Derek Chauvin trial. And I know that personally, I've tried to make an effort to reach out to people in my office. We've had a lot of conversations on race We've had a lot of book clubs. Um, we just uh, 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 finished another one the other day. Uh, we've tried to do the work within the office to think about how race impacts all of us in our interactions. And we've also tried to do a lot of work reaching out to others. I think we'll be better prepared for what comes if you know, we, we enter this in, in, in a spirit of engagement with one another. And that's why you know, for those in, in leadership, I think reaching out 
uh, to members of the community now and talking things through is incredibly important and will be as we move ahead. So I'll close by saying thank you again for the opportunity to be with you this morning. And I look forward to questions and comments. Um, thank you very much, Attorney General, for both inspiring us and sharing us, uh, sharing with us so much of the good work that you and, and your, your office are doing. Uh, I think we do have time for a couple of questions. And so um, I'm going to read them from the audience. But the first audience question is, what are the ways that students can take meaningful action as they return to the world and make an impact in different ways as they return to the new normal, whatever that is, post-pandemic? Um, I have been so inspired by our young people who, you know, have just pushed so much on issues of, of racial justice, on addressing gun violence, on environmental uh, justice and climate change. I would say, first of all, just keep being you. Study hard, engage with one another, take care of one another. Um, but second, you know, go beyond your campus uh, to reach out to the community around you. There are so many people in need right around you. There are wonderful organizations to partner with, to support. And I think that experience informs learning in a way that classroom uh, experience informs one's learning. So. Uh, that's just to say, don't do it in a vacuum. <clears throat> Get out and engage. And I think engage with a range of ages, too, and a range of experiences. Um, that will help inform and educate older people like myself. Um, and I think it, you know, it's just the way we're going to build community. Um, and recognize, too, you know, think about how young Martin Luther King was when he stood up. You know, think about how young John Lewis was when he stood up. I could go on and on. Sometimes we forget that truly the movement makers and those who brought about transformational change in this country were in fact quite young at the time. And to me, that is so inspiring. And thank you, uh, all you young people for uh, the resilience you've shown this year and also for the optimism and inspiration you provide to, to all of us going forward. I will close by saying I, on this, I had the privilege last week of meeting with the founders of Black Boston, a group formed out of George Floyd's murder. And um, these women are uh, young, uh, 20, 21, and a really incredible uh, conversation. And I learned so much. And together, we're going to actually go do some things. And it just, you know, they are rightly uh, urgent and unyielding and impatient, and they should be. They should be, and and you know I encourage that that same uh, attitude and, and pressure, uh, including on people you know like me in elected office. Um, that that's a good thing, and it's healthy for democracy. Um, we have another question, but let me just say that you know age is a relative thing. You just referred to yourself as an older person. I think I may have been an undergraduate here when your dad was. So, <laughs> um, in any event. We, we haven't uh, changed a bit. <laughs> uh, Attorney General, how do you envision universities as institutions supporting communities if, beyond providing resources post-pandemic? You know, I just think that one of the things we have going for us here, and not to be provincial, but in Massachusetts in particular, we have this incredible ecosystem of our colleges and universities um, look at the industries, whether it's biotech or life sciences, so many of them connected to our universities and our research institutions. Um, I think that it would be helpful if colleges and universities would be open to deeper conversations with government, um, with business about how to solve today's problems. And I put responsibility on government for that, actually. Um, I think government should be reaching out more to colleges and universities, not just simply for, let's take your pilot funding and we'll apply it towards some nice, well, you know, worthy project. But, you know, how can we harness the intellectual capital and the ideas and the know-how um, and, and apply that, you know, to to work, to address whether it's issues of our education system or transportation, what's happening with respect to our clean energy economy and the like. That's that's what I would 
like to, that's where I think we could really grow um, in, in this state. And, you know, we have no, no finer institution represented than, than the likes of Tufts, of course. Well, and if, if I can brag on our president for just a moment, um, you know, when the pandemic first hit, uh, President Monaco really played a, an important leadership role in all of higher education in Massachusetts in informing um, state government's response and informing um, testing systems, et cetera. So uh, my hat's off to the, to the president of Tufts. I th think we've run out of, I think we've come to the, uh, we, oh, David Gibbs has the last question. So I've just, I'm getting my instructions from the chat. Uh, well, I guess, David, I'm going to read your questions. How do you envision universities supporting? Oh, I already read that. Um, the same question. I guess we have run out of time. I was told we had a hard stop at well, 10. Well, I can take I can take more questions. I know we started a little late here on the snowy morning, but I know you have a full agenda too, so. Okay. Um, I'm going to call on Shen Chi. Is that mm -hmm. right, Shirley? Uh, so uh, we know. Thank you, uh, uh, um, Mara. Mara, thank yeah, you. <laughs> yeah. Um, really appreciate all the great work that you're doing. And my question is that we know that um, uh, cultural and linguistic barriers often preventing uh, BIPOC and immigrant communities from accessing the important uh, support and information, and also uh, preventing them from um, participating in community assessment and data collection process. So my question is, uh, what can your office do to address this issue, uh, you know, like beyond just co conducting community um, assessments? And, you know, how, how do you implement the, the recommendations from the various task force that you just mentioned? Yeah, you know, it's it's a great question. And, and um, a lot of it is just uh, communication, making sure that my team is regularly meeting with and hearing from members of the community. And, you know, I spend a lot of time um, out across the state visiting uh, places, talking with leaders of various centers and organizations um, that, are, that are fully situated within a community. And you know, what we've done, and we have made it a practice, uh, we offer multilingual resources online and in paper as well. You know, I'll never forget being in a food pantry line in Chelsea, um, maybe a little less than a year ago, where <clears throat> it was predominantly Spanish speakers, and to have a piece of paper that my office created that told them that, no, your landlord cannot evict you right now, and if you have an issue, call this number, we'll call the landlord and take care of that was really helpful um, to be able to, to tell, you know, give that. And I remember giving this, this paper to a gentleman who, whose landlord had just threatened to call ice on him if he didn't leave the apartment. And so, you know, making sure that we've got language uh, resources and, in, in, you know, many different uh, languages available is, is important. Um, and, and we do that. And we put out this year, you know, information on their rights as people's rights as an employee, you know, earned sick time, um, health care and insurance, uh, resources, um, you know, protecting civil rights, um, domestic violence even, you know, making sure they knew they couldn't, people knew they couldn't get evicted, that their utilities couldn't be shut off. And when we create these materials, the other thing I'd add is this, we don't just dream them up ourselves, we actually get input from our community stakeholders and members of our council so that we are able to deliver that information, prepare it in a way that is culturally sensitive and, uh, and appropriate. Because you're right, it is all about breaking barriers. So that's the first thing. The second thing that is really key is developing trust. And I understand, particularly after the last four years where the former president and his administration tormented our immigrant communities you know, drove them away from schools, drove them away from wanting to, 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 to go to the doctors, <clears throat> denigrated, demoralized, so many people in the shadows, fearful of government. And, and some, you know, have come from places, of course, where, you know, they fled because government was not, was not friendly to them. And so I think for those of us in government 
establishing that trust, which yes, you do by showing up at events, you do by inviting people into your office, uh, but more importantly, I think you do that by doing the teamwork together. And that's why, you know, my team will continue to be out, whether it's at, in mosques or churches or neighborhood associations or health centers, um, partnering, you know, with, with folks in, in the community, like Chelsea Collaborative, for example, um, you know, this is this is kind of the work I think I think at least that we need to do to break to break some of these barriers and we can do it. But again, it takes it takes effort and work. But I think anything that's worth anything usually does. And there's there's nothing more important, I think, than, than addressing the issues of racial disparity and really reckoning with that in our country right now in this time. We're not going to go forward. It's been a, a corrosive cancer on our democracy. We now have the opportunity <clears throat> to address it, and I'm um, I'm pleased about that. Um, but but it does take effort and collective action. Attorney General Mora, uh, I can't thank you enough for joining us this morning for sharing your time with us, but also for thank I want to thank you for your service to the Commonwealth and for your leadership. And we hope you'll be a a regular visitor to 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 this campus once we once we reopen, so. I look forward to coming back on campus. Absolutely, my best to all of you and all of you who are participating. Thank you for the work that you do in, in, in the realms of, of your lives. And again, thank you, Dean Solomon. Thank you, President Monaco, for your leadership and uh, have a wonderful uh, rest, of, uh, rest of the program. Thank you so much. Uh, that was terrific um, and a great start to the day's conversations. Um, before we break into discussion groups, however, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce two special guests who will share their unique perspectives, Ella Batel Asafa and Ben Hires. Ella Batel is a Boston native and a Tufts junior studying African history. She is a Tisch Scholar, which is a rigorous leadership program for undergraduates. And through the Scholars Program, she has interned for two years with Action for Boston Community Development, Boston's anti-poverty organization. Ella Battel is also the coordinator of the Tufts with Rwanda Fellowship, which is a year-long program that focuses on genocide education, building international relationships, empowering, empowering participants to become global ambassadors for their communities. And if that weren't enough, Ella Battel also volunteers as a tutor to support English learners in the Boston public schools and Amharic language learners in the Boston area. Following Ella Battel, we'll hear from Ben Hires, who joined the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center as its CEO in June of 2020. Starting with his first job as a youth counselor, Ben has had a long career in nonprofit leadership, serving young people and families. Previously, he worked at the Boston Children's Chorus and played a key role elevating the choir's social justice mission to bring diverse young people with their families together. As Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Boston Public Library, Ben built strong relationships across many sectors to advance the library's mission of providing educational and cultural enrichment free to all Boston residents. Ben's a member of the Cham Quincy Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. He previously served as a board member of Urbanity, Dance, and the Alston Brighton Community Development Corporation. Thanks to both of us for joining us today. And let's begin with Ella Battelle. Thank you, Dean Solomon. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Ella Battelle Asafa, and I'm a third year history student at Tufts. It's an honor to be here and be a part of a community conversation centering racial justice during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond, bringing forward the work of members of the Tufts community. In accordance with this mission of racial justice, please join me in a moment of silence, remembering the life of Dante Wright, who was killed by a police officer in Minnesota on April 11th, and 13-year-old Alex Toledo, who was killed by police in Chicago.
Thank you. Over the last three years here at Tufts University, I've had the immense privilege of being a part of the Tisch community, working alongside fellow Tisch scholars on various projects connecting our passions for public service, our academic endeavors, and collaborations with, and collaboration with organizations in the greater Boston area to bridge gaps in education, among other key social justice issues. These students, faculty, staff, and community partners present today have stepped up this past year to meet the challenges COVID-19 presented. Thank you all for the work that you do. The opportunity to be a part of such a civically oriented environment has led to immeasurable learning moments for me. As a native Bostonian, I was able to return home with new ideas and perspectives to support community leaders, organizations, and educators in lessening the impact of disparities in the field of education. This work has only been amplified during the COVID-19 pandemic with students, educators, and guardians navigating an unprecedented time of uncertainty and change. As an immigrant and former English as a second, as a second language learner or ESL who grew up in the Boston public school system, I found it essential that both educators and students were offered the support and help they needed. During the pandemic, our school systems have been hit hard. Teachers feel the burnout, students are exhausted, and parents are having a hard time navigating this time of crisis. Remembering my time as a student, newly arrived in Boston from Ethiopia, I felt deeply for students trying to do their best, having the capacity to do well, and just needing someone on their side for mentorship, advocacy, and constant support. This had been essential for my success, and I understood very well its necessity in light of the massive inequalities in education. To, to this end, in partnership with my former high school Spanish teacher, Ms. Denise Beckler Rodriguez at the John D. O'Brien School of Mathematics and Science in Roxbury, I began tutoring English student learners in a Saturday academic support program. This work has shown me how the COVID-19 pandemic has destabilized learning and the necessity to do better for the sake of, for the sake of our students and their future. Oftentimes, students struggling are overlooked or made invisible in the classroom space. It is imperative, especially now with so many students finding it hard to learn effectively, that we provide ample support to aid them in their journeys. I would like to end by encouraging you to find ways, small and big, to build connections and beneficial partnerships that can broaden students' opportunities and learning. Thank you. I'll pass the mic to my co-panelist, Ben Hires now. Thanks, El Patel. Good morning, everybody. I'm honored to serve as the CEO of Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center, an essential social service agency to Asian and new immigrants to Greater Boston and a Tufts University community partner. I'd like to thank President Monaco and Dean Salama and Shirley Mark for inviting me here today with my esteemed speakers, El Patel and Attorney General Mari Healy, who I invite to Chinatown to hear directly what we've been doing to support the community. Today's topic, racial justice, is inextricably linked to my joining the BCNC community. I joined BCNC on June 1st this past year, just one week after George Floyd was murdered. I joined Boston's Chinatown community after the neighborhood was impacted earlier than others by unfounded fears due to COVID-19 and then months of anti-Asian and anti-Chinese rhetoric, verbal harassment and physical assault. And perhaps like many of you, I finally joined the Asian community in solidarity for the first time in my life. Now, what do, you, what, what do I mean I joined the Asian community for the first time? Well, personally, I was born in South Korea and adopted by my family and grew up in Southern New Jersey. A shout out from everybody from the Garden State today. I went to elementary school and high school there and then came to college in Boston. But throughout my career, throughout my education and life, I actually learned very little about the contributions, lives, and experiences of Asian immigrants and Asian Americans, or really the history of any other uh, of the members of our diverse communities. While at the same time, like many of you, I grew up learning that the United States was a melting pot, a country of immigrants, and the land of opportunity. For the last year, I've worked closely with many other Tufts community partners, like 
Asian Task Force Against Domestic Violence, Asian Community Development Corporation, Chinese Progressive Association, Viet Aid, and many others. And I've quickly come to learn about the unique challenges our Asian community faces. Today's current inequities, anti-Asian prejudice, and racism are ingrained and systemic to American culture and institutions. This past year has given rise to more attention in my lifetime about the history of racism towards Asians in the US. For example, almost embarrassingly, I learned about for the first time the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act banning all Chinese immigration, the first law of placing a restriction on immigration that lasted 60 years and was not fully opened uh, immigration to Asians until the Immigration Act of 1965. The issue of Asian invisibility is not cultural, but purposeful. I want to fast forward to today and share some of the systemic inequalities and inequities facing the Asian community that I've seen impact the families we serve and share some ideas about how racial justice can be the center of all of our work. Terms are important, so I'd like to define how I'm using racial justice. Racial justice addresses racism, which is a complex system of beliefs and behaviors grounded in the presumed superiority of the white race. Justice and equity are the implementation of policies, practices, attitudes, and actions that produce equitable power, access, and treatment and outcomes for all. And justice and equity is not just about implementation, but also dismantling policies do not produce those outcomes. Simply put, racial justice is and should be part of civic life. As the Attorney General has mentioned, access to healthcare, whether it be physical, behavioral, mental, is not always accessible to our Asian, immigrant, and communities of color. For example, English-only sign-up options to receive COVID tests and vaccinations have been a barrier. And BCNC and many other organizations have had to help translate vaccine forms or provide inter interpretation. And many others are doing the same thing in their communities. We need to recognize the challenges our immigrant community members and community of color members are facing. There are currently bills in the uh, Massachusetts Senate and House, HD 3674 and SD 2251, to increase language access at all levels of government. I encourage you to support this, but this is just the start. As the Attorney General has mentioned, we need more culturally competent and community-based care to promote and provide ways that will be effective in communities of color. Many Tufts partners like the Brazilian Immigrant Center, Sociedad Latina, and the United South End Settlements are the first and perhaps only source of health information and services to community members. We need to invest in these frontline organizations that are supporting frontline workers and community members. Now, the recent rise of anti-Asian violence is deeply troubling, horrific, but definitely not new, just like police brutality towards African-Americans. We're only just hearing more about it through the coverage of citizens like you. Recently, the Asian Pacific Islander Civic Action Network, or APIs CAN, held a town hall on anti-Asian hate that over 3,000 people from all different backgrounds attended, including students from BCNC's English as a Second Language program. Our teachers asked our English learners to reflect on what they heard. And in addition to empathizing with the feelings of anger and fear, our immigrant students shared that they heard the importance of education about our shared racial and ethnic histories. They heard about the importance of unity among communities of color to speak out against racism. And they heard the importance and value for the sacrifice that they've made to move to this country to make a better life to earn an education for their families, find fulfilling work, and give back to their communities. To truly help community members feel safe, we must ensure that they have resources and opportunities to lead dignified lives. Deep solutions that the Attorney General mentioned include strategies investing in jobs, housing, immigration, healthcare, and education to truly address long-term systemic racism and extreme inequality. So how can you support this effort? What can you do? Well, again, I'm going to point to a number of different legislative policy measures that can help. Support Bill 3341 in the House, 
and Bill 2014 in the Senate to create a commission on anti-racism and equity in education that will help develop curriculum with a social justice perspective and can lead to Asian American and other ethnic studies. Support the driver license for all bill so all community members can work and drive safely and continue to support affordable housing, rent stabilization, and other housing recovery bills that help our community members have a safe place to call home. I'd like to end by referencing a BCNC collaborator and friend, uh, Peter Levine, Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at Tisch College. In his book, We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For, he writes about deliberation, collaboration, and civic relationships as well as facts, values, and strategies. I think the relationships between community members and organizations and our universities, civic government, and others are critical if we really wanna create the world that reflects the values we hold. How I understand this simply is, if you don't know someone who's lost their job due to COVID-19, if you don't know how it feels to be constantly seen as other and invisible, if you don't know what it's like to be shut out from opportunities, then how will you be moved to act? I think our hearts are moved for our friends and our families and those most close to us, but I ask all of us to let our hearts be moved for our neighbors and those that seem like they may be different than us, but actually are more similar than we may realize. None of us live in the vacuum. So collectively, BCNC's immigrant students, elected officials like the Attorney General and all of you, we need not only deliberate, talk, or post on Instagram about inequity and change, but we really need to build true relationships, real relationships that will help move us to act in ways that will truly make justice and equity a reality. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Attorney General Healy, um, Ben and Ella Battelle for sharing your wisdom and your perspectives on what racial justice means to you and the communities in which you work. I believe that we've all learned from you and I feel inspired by your leadership. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys their breakout group discussions. And now I'll pass it over to Shirley who will transition us to the breakout groups. Thank you, Shirley. Good morning all. It's so good to have so many of you join us. If you don't have any questions about your breakout groups, then you can um, sign off this webinar and sign into your um, Zoom link for the breakout group. If you have questions, then you can post them. I think the chat is open now. You can post them either in the Q&A or in the chat and um, one of us will answer your questions. I want to thank President Monaco and Alan, Ben and Ella Battelle, and of course the Attorney General. It was an amazing program and I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you and thank you to all our facilitators.